as you can be, to be peaceful, open, prayerful, and attentive. I know we're in a crowded room, and I'll wait until everyone gets settled, because I know people are, are coming in peacefully now. I know we're in a crowded room and have a big agenda, so I invite you to enjoy it, to be positive and peaceful all day, to be the peace we're talking about, the peace we seek. Remember to keep drinking water. Um, there's lots of water in the back of the room, as I said yesterday, and we'll have two 30-minute coffee breaks today. If you have any questions today, um, I'll be here, John as well, Ken, as well as the Pache Bene staff and those at the registration table. We're happy to help. Please read through your schedule and the conference booklet so you are up to speed on what's going on for today with the program. Also, I'd like to welcome again all the thousands of you who are watching live stream Campaign Nonviolence 2015. Welcome across the nation and across the world. I also was notified by John um, recently, this morning, that we are in the New York Times today. <laughs> woo -hoo! So please check it out in the New York Times, speaking about the Campaign Nonviolence Conference. So uh, awesome, awesome. Really, really amazing work, and we're grateful. All right, so it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you now one of the world's leading historians on nonviolence. Erica Chenowitz is an associate professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver and an associate senior researcher at the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. Her groundbreaking book, While Civil Resistance Work, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, attracted national and international attention and won many awards for its brilliant use of social science to demonstrate in detail how and why nonviolent resistance to national and international conflict works. Why Civil Resistance Works is the first systematic study of its kind and demonstrates once and for all the power of nonviolent civil resistance for positive social change. Foreign Policy Magazine ranked her among the top 100 global thinkers for her work on the empirical study of nonviolent resistance. We are thrilled and honored to welcome one of the world's leading researchers into nonviolent conflict resolution to our national conference and on nonviolence. Please stand and join me in giving a rousing warm welcome for Professor Erica Chenowitz. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, one of the most uh, exciting and heartening things for me to witness is how many people are willing to devote their time, effort, creativity, and energy to causes like this. Uh, and it's always an honor for me to speak uh, to audiences such as this. I'm an academic, which means that at 9 a.m. on most mornings, I'm trying to wake up a bunch of 18 to 22-year-olds um, and I can see that hopefully uh, you're all awake already and, and ready to, uh, to engage in some interesting conversation. Um, I wanted to start uh, by letting you know a little bit about my own background because I still feel a bit like an intruder into the field of nonviolent conflict. Um, my own uh, academic background is that I went to pursue a PhD in, um, in basically security studies, which is the, the field that deals in understanding why people use political violence to achieve their goals, uh, and also how to basically use violence to stop them. Uh, and uh, that's government violence, of course. So most of my, my academic research throughout my PhD studies was in trying to understand how to do effective counterterrorism, um, how to prevent terrorism from occurring in the first place, and a variety of other topics of this kind. And what happened is that right as I was wrapping up my PhD dissertation, I got invited to a workshop in um, Colorado Springs called People, Power, and Pedagogy. And it was a workshop um, that was sponsored by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict uh, to try to get P 
people like me, uh, clueless security studies scholars, um, to, to be exposed to the literature on nonviolent resistance um, and to maybe interest, our, uh, interest us or at least pique our curiosity uh, into these different topics. And um, when I was invited to the workshop, I was invited kind of as a joke. Um, one of my friends forwarded me the announcement of the workshop and said the other side of the coin, ha, ha, ha. Um, but I was really intrigued because they talked about the free books that I would get and, um, and the free food. And, you know, academics, we go for free books and free food, you know, throughout our careers. And so, uh, so I applied for the workshop and I show up there and I got the box of books and they're by people like uh, Gene Sharp and Peter Ackerman and Jack Duvall and Steven Zunis and um, a variety of other scholars of this kind. And, and I'm reading them, and I was so struck by the fact that I'd never heard of any of these people before. And I was, I was just about to get my PhD in the field of political science, and they were political scientists, and I'd never heard their names. I was also really struck by the fact that they had um, adopted sort of an approach to the study of nonviolent resistance that was totally different from what I thought of when I thought of nonviolence. So if you said nonviolence to me, I would think just, um, really well-meaning, but don't be insulted, naive people um, who, <laughs> who, were, who were very well-meaning, but, but probably never going to do anything except, you know, you know it, approach a situation in a way that was morally admirable, but maybe never going to produce any meaningful results. So that, that's, the, that's sort of the standpoint that I came to this material from. And, and the, the literature that I was looking at was talking about nonviolent resistance as um, as an active form of conflict where, you know, the main difference between that and some kind of armed insurgency was just that the people were unarmed and they were building power through the force of popular participation and changing the political dynamics on the ground as opposed to, you know, shooting the other people and wearing them down through attrition um, in order to basically win the day by having more people standing at the end of the day than the other side. Uh, which is what I was used to studying. So, so basically, um, I was struck by the strategic wisdom of some of, these, um, some of these insights, but I still had some really big reservations. So I go to this workshop, and um, I'm like the person in the back of the room that everybody wishes would shut up at the end of the day, um, because you know people would say, they would bring up examples, like, you know, this worked really well in the Philippines, um, it worked really well in, in Serbia against Milosevic. It worked really well in, um, in Poland, you know, the solidarity uh, movement and so forth. And I would say, well, it didn't work in Tiananmen Square, did it? And, you know, it didn't work in the, the Velvet Revolution. You know, and I could think of a lot of examples where we think of, like, as iconic examples of nonviolent resistance where the people were summarily crushed. Um, so I couldn't really balance in my mind how many of these that they were talking about were kind of exemplar and how many of the ones I was thinking of were more representative of the way things really went. And so I kept asking, has anybody actually cataloged these things and counted? Um, and people said, well, you know, we, we prefer to focus on cases because that, you know, we can go in depth and whatever. And so at the end of the week, um, this woman was there named Maria Stefan, and uh, she was their educational outreach person. And she and I would have these knockdown, drag out arguments, like into the night. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the week, we kind of made an intellectual bet, which was, okay, let's see which one of us is, is right, the skeptic or the optimist about nonviolent resistance, and we're gonna count. Uh, we're actually gonna go back and count like as many um, campaigns as we can find of nonviolent resistance and of violent resistance um, around the world since 1900, and we're gonna look at their outcomes and see which one wins the horse race, so to speak. And um, you know, the, the interesting thing here is that because I was such a skeptic, I insisted that we pick the hardest cases. So um, we went from 1900 to 2006, but we started doing research only on these campaigns of mass resistance where people were seeking what you might call maximalist claims, which means they were trying to remove an incumbent leader from power, um, or they were trying to become an independent country, either by secession, by expelling a foreign colonial power or occupation, um, or by, you know, like, territorial independence of some sort. 
And so we, um, we went for these cases because I thought, you know, these are the cases where people are going to ask you when the rubber meets the road whether this thing can actually succeed, especially because we usually associate those types of maximalist movements as violent around the world. And so we also adopted a very strict metric of success. Um, we didn't look at things like progress um, toward the goals. We looked at whether the campaign succeeded outright or not. They had to achieve those goals of removing the incumbent leader from power or territorial independence within a year of their peak activities. And they had to have had a discernible impact on the outcome. So like if a leader died of a heart attack in office, we'd count that as a failure, even though you could make a claim that indirectly it was related. <laughs> So, so we decided to do this because, um, because I wanted to win, right? Uh, and, um, and I thought, if you apply these like, strict measures to uh, the outcomes of success, then we're going to find you know, that basically the violent ones are more, more successful. So anyway, we, we collect these data. We're counting them. We're going back to 1900. So this means we have to go into archival um, documents. We have to go into government documents. We have to go into... Um, uh, lots of case studies. So I, I got to read like everything that was written about this topic for two years um, to collect these data. And there was also a very timely release of a bibliography um, called um, the, uh, the Bibliography of Civil Resistance that was published online right that year in 2006. And they had cataloged like everything anybody had ever written about all these different campaigns. So I went and read all that stuff and then we used that to aggregate the figures. And then after we had a preliminary list of these campaigns, we circulated them to about a dozen experts around the world um, to ask them to assess the outcomes of those campaigns and to ask them whether we left out any that they knew about because we were really worried about underreporting. At the end of the day, um, when we got the numbers back, this was a two years process, and in 2008, I was sitting in a coffee shop in California when I finally put the, the finishing touches on the, the data collection and cleaning, and I crunched the numbers, and I was totally blown away because the nonviolent resistance campaigns of that type during that time were succeeding more than twice as often as the violent counterparts. And actually, this was becoming more um, common over time. So it was um, increasingly effective since about the 60s, the 1960s on, nonviolent resistance has become increasingly effective, and violent resistance has become increasingly ineffective. Another thing that's really amazing is that nonviolent resistance is becoming much more frequent. To put this in perspective, just in the first four years of this decade, <clears throat> there are already more nonviolent campaign onsets of the type that I study than there were in the entire 1990s, which was a big decade for nonviolent resistance. Um, so it's becoming very common. And actually, despite what the news looks like, uh, violent resistance is becoming increasingly unpopular. It's going out of style in a major way, except in a few key places in the world. And so this is like pretty good news for proponents of nonviolent resistance. Um, and it took me a while to come to terms with this. Um, and I thought, if this is true, we better come up with some pretty good reasons why this is true, because it flies in the face of you know, decades of scholarship that would suggest the opposite from my field. And so um, I'll just, you know, uh, mention one thing. My friend Ivan Marovic sometimes likes to tell this story about Niels Bohr. Um, this is like a totally different field, the, the nuclear physicist, since we're talking about um, atomic uh, things this weekend. I'll offer this uh, little anecdote. So Niels Bohr apparently um, had a country home and one of his students came to visit him in his country home and noticed there was a horseshoe hanging above the door to the entryway. And he walks in and he says, Professor Bohr, what is that above your door? He says, it's a horseshoe. He says, yeah, but why do you have it? And he says, they say it's good luck. And he says, Professor Bohr, do you really believe in things like that? And he said, oh, they say it works even if you don't believe in it. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's kind of like my revelation around nonviolent resistance. Um, it works. It's working, even if we don't see it and we don't believe in it. Um, so um, what, are the, what are the reasons it works, even though we don't believe in it? Well, it works for some really practical reasons, the first of which is that um, nonviolent campaigns, when we drilled down into those data, 
are extremely popular and inclusive in a way that it allows people of all different stripes to participate. And uh, participation is the most important factor determining the success of any type of popular movement, whether it's violent or nonviolent. Um, in fact, uh, there was an economist named Mark Lickbach who came up with a formulation that he called the 5% the rule. And this was in a book he wrote about rebel groups. And he said that uh, basically no government can withstand a sustained challenge of its population if just 5% of the population is mobilized. And um, that was a, an insight that he kind of proffered back in the 1990s, but hadn't actually been empirically uh, tested. And the reason is certainly because, you know, if you, if you think about 5% of the population of the United States, you're talking about, what, 15 million people um, engaged in some kind of really uh, disruptive activity, that's gonna do something. I mean, if, if I even imagine in this country 15 million people doing something together in a sustained way, uh, I imagine something's gonna change in the country. Um, so basically, um, going in with this insight of about the 5% rule, uh, we counted the peak participation in all of these different campaigns. And again, the results were shocking because the nonviolent campaigns were about 11 times larger as a proportion of the overall population compared to the violent ones. So they're way bigger. Um, and uh, what we also found is that none of the campaigns had failed after just 3.5% uh, of, the, of the population mobilizing. So Lickbach was really close, um, but it actually is a little bit less. Now that's 11 and a half million people in the US. So it's not a small, it's not a small number of people. And in fact, in most places, you're never gonna get that level of active mobilization unless you have a very large amount of latent support as well. We just looked at the number of people actively participating as that figure. And here's the, the big kicker. None of the campaigns got to that level of active popular mobilization without being nonviolent. So only the nonviolent campaigns in our data set surpassed the 3.5% threshold. So why is that? Why are people more likely to engage in nonviolent resistance than violent resistance? Well, we have to keep in mind that the cases we're looking at are cases where these campaigns were facing like a really brutal, usually authoritarian opponent that was not hesitant to use massive repressive violence against these people. So just keep that in mind as we're talking about these huge numbers of people. And um, what we found when we sort of looked into these cases was that nonviolent resistance have a, has a lot of lower barriers to participation. So the first is a lower physical barrier. And because of the, the really diverse types of techniques that can be employed in nonviolent resistance, things like stay away demonstrations can often be just as disruptive as an active street demonstration, or say the general strike paired with a stay away from work, um, or a work stoppage, or um, some kind of uh, dispersed technique can often mean that these campaigns are um, are able to elicit the participation of people who don't have a very high physical risk profile. Um, so like people like me, uh, <laughs> who, who, you know, I, I don't have a very high physical risk profile, turns out. I don't, I'm not the person who's gonna be right at the front uh, confronting the, the, the oppressive opponent. I'm gonna be sort of in the middle, uh, <laughs> letting the people with the higher risk profile do what they wanna do, but I, and I'm gonna be further back. Um, and the, 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 the truth is that a lot of people in society are, are like me, right? They, they're willing to stand up for something, but aren't necessarily the ones who are the highest risk, who are gonna be willing to be right out front. But we, uh, a successful campaign needs the people like me uh, and, and the people with these kind of mid-level risk profiles to participate. Armed resistance doesn't let people like me participate uh, with the mid-level risk profile. Um, because uh, really no matter what you're doing, whether you're training, whether you're hiding, whether you're actively engaging the opponent, um, your risk profile is at a max. And so uh, this precludes the participation of um, many women, many people uh, with physical disabilities, elderly population, children. Um, and that's why we see the sort of homogenization of armed campaigns into just basically males, young able-bodied males. We often see violent campaigns where women are involved, 
but they're actually the exception rather than the rule. Um, <clears throat> the second lower barrier to participation is uh, basically a lower um, information barrier. So for example, I've, I've told you a little bit about myself and my risk profile. So let's say that you live with me in a very repressive country and we're in the, our apartment together and uh, some neighbor comes and knocks on our door and says, we know that you two appreciate the cause uh, that we're fighting over and we're gonna have a big demonstration down the street at eight o'clock tonight and we really want you to come. You should know that there are gonna be police and maybe military there, um, but we hope you come anyway because there's power in numbers. So um, if you're like me, uh, we sit and have a conversation where we say, what do you think? Shall we wait until 8.30? Um, <laughs> and shall we look out the window and see how many people actually are showing up? Um, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and so I'm going to look out the window and I'm going to see how many people are kind of accumulating there in the square. And if it looks like it's the usual suspects of six people, I'm probably not going to go. Um, but if it looks like there are 6,000 people, it probably starts to look a lot like a party. And it also starts to look a lot like, even if um, the repression starts, my like, proportion, my risk proportion of being one of the people hurt is really low, really low. So yeah, let's go. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we join the party. And that's, you know, that's that information barrier. It's very accessible to nonviolent campaigns. In fact, many of those campaigns deliberately use techniques like street demonstrations to demonstrate how big they are and activate that exact process in people's minds. There's safety in numbers. You can join, this is safe. Um, and those people with the mid-level risk profiles will come. Um, <clears throat> armed campaigns typically have a problem with this because um, they're often very clandestine. And the only time you really see their numbers is when they're in full assault. And that's when you're hiding and you're not looking out your window. Um, so if you're a person that is trying to join the armed insurgency, uh, you have to basically decide, regardless of how big you think it is, to join. Again, people with the max risk profile are the ones who are gonna do that. There's also a lower, um, basically a lower commitment barrier. And by that, I don't mean commitment to the cause because Certainly, the, some of the most committed people we see to any type of movement are nonviolent um, in, in their activities. But I mean lower commitment to joining and leaving. So um, with nonviolent uh, movements, um, one can join simply by saying, I want to join and I'm willing to subject myself to your group's rules of engagement vis-a-vis uh, -vis nonviolent action. And often people don't have to quit their day jobs or leave their family behind. They may become a fugitive of, 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 a, of a sort, uh, but they're, you know, that, that is a shared status with any number of, of other people. Um, and then when one needs to leave, uh, usually one can leave uh, without then having to have some kind of, um, you know, a lifelong uh, life on the run unless they're very high up in the movement. Now, this contrasts very much with armed insurgencies where as soon as people join the armed insurgency, it's often a request that they kill somebody on the other side to demonstrate that they aren't an informant. Um, so the level of commitment has to be expressed immediately upon joining. Um, and then once one does that, of course the reason that that's required is so they cannot leave. So that they have to be part of the group, so that the group becomes their protection. And the group is their protection, and therefore it's not as easy to just say, you know what, my life is such now that I need to leave this movement. Goodbye, you all. Um, it's very hard to do for an, for an armed uh, rebel once they've crossed that line into it um, to leave. And so because the commitment level is so different uh, for the nonviolent and violent campaigns, it's easier for people to sort of be casual insurgents, so to speak, for a nonviolent campaign. Um, and then finally, there's a lower moral barrier. Certainly many people have in them, uh, for whatever reason, be it um, their faith life, their upbringing, um, their personality type, they have resistance to the notion of using offensive violence against others. In fact, this is even true in the military. Um, there have been many studies done um, by armies of their own troops trying to understand why it is that they're so hesitant to kill. 
because we know that, um, that in, in battle contexts, in uh, especially drafted armies, that most people will deliberately jam their weapons or they'll shoot into the air or they'll defect or desert. They don't want to shoot at the other side. Um, and so uh, basically, uh, certainly adding distance to the weapons, like having them shoot artillery, makes it easier for them. Um, but basically, people have a tough time overcoming their hesitancy to engaging in offensive violence. The, this is the average person. Now, given that information, um, that means that uh, for armed groups, they have to really go to great lengths to override people's hesitancy to kill. And that requires a lot of resources, a lot of kind of conditioning, um, and a whole process that makes it very costly for the groups. But for nonviolent campaigns, it's never going to be an issue because people, the training is how to basically prepare yourself to be, um, to, to, to be hurt without responding. And that, that's like a different set of issues and actually one that, believe it or not, tends to come more easily to people than the training of getting them to offensively kill. So because of these lower barriers, we know that these campaigns are getting really big. So what, what's the big deal about big campaigns? The big deal about them is that when campaigns become large enough, they start to completely change the political calculations and economic calculations and social calculations of people that reside in various parts of the opponent's pillars of support. So what do I mean by pillars of support? If the opponent is a government, I mean the people who work as civilian bureaucrats or the people who work as state media or the people who work in the military and security forces economic elites, business elites, people like this. And what we find is that the larger a campaign gets, if it's nonviolent, the more likely people in those pillars of support are to defect, meaning they do not follow orders to shoot on demonstrators, or they actually switch sides altogether. So why are they doing that? Well, let's pretend that we're one of these like captains in the army in a very repressive regime. And Let's say I'm standing there um, on the front line, and there's like 200,000 people standing in front of me. And I'm nervous. I'm definitely nervous. Um, but as more and more people come, things are starting to go through my mind. And the things that are going through my mind are like this. I wonder what my wife is going to think of me if I am caught on camera shooting one of these people. Or I wonder if I'm caught on camera shooting one of these people and this regime goes down, whether my wife is going to be hurt. Or I wonder if when I shoot these people, my kids are going to be able to go to whatever school they want. Or I wonder if I'm going to get killed if I shoot these people. So these are the types of things going on in one's mind when they're standing there. Now, if, if those people who are standing there against the security forces start to actively attack them, then it goes straight to you, I'm going to get killed and I'm going to defend myself. Um, Whereas uh, if the people are just standing there and they're being really disruptive and being really uh, kind of intense, but they're not hurting me, and in fact they're asking me to join them, um, or they're asking me to you know, follow my conscience and not you know, do, the, do the thing where I shoot into the crowd, um, then you know, I have a choice to make. I have room for a choice. And about, we find about half the time the security forces in a very large nonviolent campaign choose not to shoot about half the time. So that's, not, that's a non-trivial finding. Um, and it actually speaks to that kind of strategic logic that I was talking about, that it's not so much about winning them over per se on a moral basis, but more forcing them to make a calculation about what their own long-term interest is in the situation. And for very large campaigns, they can, they can push the envelope on that. Um, in fact, we only looked at security force defections, but in, in later work where we've looked at things like economic elites defecting and so forth, um, like in South Africa, it was really the economic elites because the security forces really weren't going to defect um, in that case against the um, anti-apartheid movement, but the economic elites did and would. Um, so basically, um, sometimes the security forces do fire uh, on, on the, the demonstrators. That's definitely the case. Um, it's uh, about 90% of our campaigns experienced violent repression, lethal repression by the opponent uh, during the, the, the peak mobilization of the campaign. So th there's a lot of that. Um, but even in the cases where there was massive violent repression, 
this, the nonviolent campaigns were still outperforming the violent ones by two to one. And so there's an interesting question about why that's the case. And we think there's really two reasons. The first is because of backfire. And backfire is when um, the intended effect of the repression is the opposite of what you get. So uh, for example, if, if there are 200,000 people in a street demonstration, and then there's um, a commitment of violence by the state, uh, the next day 400,000 people turn out because they're mad about the violence from yesterday. That's backfire. That's when you get the opposite of what you intend. Turns out backfire is much more common uh, when violence is directed against unarmed people than it is when it's directed against armed insurgents. That's a generalized pattern. The second thing um, that I think may be even more important from a movement's perspective, because obviously movements don't really ever want to like deliberately provoke um, levels of repression against them, it's very risky. But this is a, a very important dynamic that we found, which is that very large movements, which nonviolent campaigns can be, have at their disposal a wide variety of tactics that they can use when things get really scary in the country, so really repressive. Um, for example, um, there are sort of two different categories of events that some scholars talk about. Categories of, or, I'm sorry, concentration and dispersion. So concentration is like the street demonstration. It's when everybody comes out to a, a single place, they, they, they uh, develop mass in that place, which is good, um, kind of for a strategic point, and it's disruptive. But the thing is that if a movement does that day after day, like at the same time, Every day they become very predictable and very vulnerable to repression because it becomes very easy for the other side to just come up with ways to, to assault them. And so um, very large movements can actually switch. When it becomes obvious that a big crackdown is going to happen, they can shift to methods of dispersion. They can do a mass stay at home instead of doing the demonstration. A mass stay at home is when nobody comes out uh, a, a method of dispersion is when nobody comes out to places they were expected to be. And so that means that like the security forces will show up, but nobody will be there. And that means that those security forces still want their overtime, and they also don't want to be humiliated by having their pictures up on the front page of the newspaper, police in an empty square, um, which is embarrassing, but it also means that everybody in the movement is safely inside their homes. Now in some types of repressive environments, even being in your home is not safe. And um, that said, it can still be extremely disruptive and have these very similar uh, political dynamics uh, that very large kind of mass campaigns can have. So I'll give you a very concrete example from the Iranian Revolution, and I mean the one from 77 to 79. So in the uh, kind of peak of the Iranian Revolution, people called it the 100 Days Revolution, the last 100 days or so were the society in total mobilization. 10% of the Iranian population was mobilized. It's one of the largest revolutions of all time. And uh, they were mobilized mostly in things like rallies, street demonstrations, economic non-cooperation by the bazaaris, development of alternative institutions for economic and social co-ops and so forth. But there was um, just really mass participation and they were doing mostly demonstrations street rallies and then funeral processions for people that had been cut down the day before. And it started to get really dangerous. There were thousands of people shot in the streets during this time. And um, in the last 10 or so days, or the last two weeks of this, what happened is that they were able to convince the oil workers in the countryside to go on strike. And they paired the strike with the stay-at-home demonstration. So when the Shah, um, you know, the Shah had a list of oil workers, their names and addresses, and so sent the internal security forces to their homes. When they got to their homes, they pulled them out on the streets, marched them to the oil fields, and when they got there, they agreed to work only at half pace. So then the next day, same story, oil workers stay at home, the internal security forces come door to door, pull them on the streets, march them down to the oil fields, and they work at half pace. Now after three or four days of this, the security forces think, we're not getting our overtime because the oil fields are pumping at half capacity. And you know there's very little that they could do to force them to increase the capacity. And uh, so the security forces started to call in sick. 
So right, you don't need them to actually turn to the other side. You don't need them to openly disobey. But they call in sick for work. And within a week, the Shah had to flee the country. So this is an example of the pairing of, a, of kind of the typical kinds of things people think of when they think of nonviolent resistance, a demonstration, but with something that really went straight to the wallet of these pillars of support that altered their own long-term political calculations in a way that created the crisis moment. So, um, you know, people are often concerned about what happens in these countries after the fact, and the Iranian example provides a good reason why we might want to be concerned about what happens after victory. Um, but I think that actually um, what we did in our study was we looked at whether in the longer term um, these campaigns um, were able to uh, usher in more democratic institutions and whether the countries were more um, uh, free from civil war relapse after about 10 years after the campaign ended. And we found that um, really strikingly, uh, countries in which nonviolent campaigns waged their struggles, they were 10 times more likely to be democratic just five years after the campaign ended. And um, to give you some context for that, most scholars in my field think that a real democratic consolidation um, takes about a generation. So the fact that these campaigns created it within five years is really stunning. And um, my hypothesis for why this is the case is because mass popular contention like that is almost generating democracy from below. And when I say democracy, I mean relatively free political institutions. I don't necessarily mean like neoliberal, democratic, uh, whatever. Um, I mean like on paper, like whether people can vote for the, the person in office um, and so forth. Um, and then the, the other really striking finding is about this, the lack of relapse into civil war. So countries in which nonviolent campaigns waged their struggles were about 15% um, less likely to experience a civil war relapse within a decade. So these are more peaceful countries after a nonviolent campaign. Um, so I can tell you that there are a few myths that I think are regularly kind of discussed um, about nonviolent resistance that this research really speaks to and changes our minds about if we're open-minded. The first is this very um, pervasive notion that nonviolent resistance is impossible against repressive opponents. When there is systematic repression that is so deep in a society against a particular group of people or against the society as a whole, that nonviolent resistance is impossible. Now, certainly in our data, um, that situation describes every single one of our cases because we looked only at the maximalist ones. So every one of our cases was a deeply repressive place uh, where there were either minority groups or there was the entire population that was being systematically repressed from the opponent. We also found, as I mentioned, that nonviolent campaigns outperform violent ones by two to one, even when they are directly violently repressed by the opponent. And so, contrary to what many people think, nonviolent resistance is probably the best antidote to repression and the best chance against repression. Um, violent resistance, um, when used against a repressive opponent, uh, creates mass killings of a scale that are nowhere near uh, what any of our nonviolent campaigns experienced. Much higher rates of, of deaths. Um, the second thing is that uh, there's this general sense that nonviolent resistance can't emerge or can't work in societies that are very closed to political opposition. And again, that describes pretty much every case in our data set, and yet they were able to emerge. Um, and in fact, they were more likely to succeed against authoritarian regimes uh, than against democratic ones. And part of the reason I think this is the case is because it's hard to um, create mass mobilized civil resistance in a democracy. And uh, there are a couple of reasons I think this is the case. One of the reasons might be that people have comfort in the election cycle, and they think that actually the way they participate in politics is by voting, um, and that creates a generalized apathy about uh, engaging in higher risk or more disruptive civil disobedience. The second reason, I think, is kind of a paradox. Protest is legal. So is, uh, for the time being in most places, strikes, <laughs> but maybe not forever. Um, and I think what this means is that uh, 
the, the barrier to what one can do to really be more disruptive in a democracy is a bit higher. Um, so there's a smaller set of truly uh, law-breaking civil disobedience um, in democracies than there are in many authoritarian regimes where wearing a certain color t-shirt is an act of civil disobedience. And because of that, um, people have to be very high risk in order to do it. And then the third thing that I think is uh, common in democracies is just the normalized appearance of protest, that uh, there's so many different uh, pluralistic causes in democracies that mobilization and movement sectors are extremely dispersed and diffused into different areas. So, you know, people have um, kind of single issue things, or they might even be very large causes, but they're separate from other causes. Whereas in authoritarian regimes, everybody knows what they're fighting against. Um, and it doesn't take much to sort of unify an opposition around that singular goal. Um, another common, uh, I think, misconception about nonviolent resistance is that when there's a little bit of violence, it helps the nonviolent campaign. And uh, this is often talked about, uh, not just here, but in many other places around the world. So I think it's important to understand the reasons why people think that's the case, and then to subject them to evidence. So the reasons people think that's the case are, first of all, that they think that, um, that violence helps defend oneself against government violence. So, you know, if we can, uh, if, if one needs to protect oneself against government violence, then one needs to arm oneself. Um, the second mechanism is that it's thought that by using a little bit of violence, it will kind of wake up the rest of the population and create an oppositional culture that's truly radical uh, in a way that then allows space for other people to do nonviolent resistance because they see it as the less risky option. Um, there's also an argument that violent flanks create a situation where the government would actually rather negotiate with the so-called moderate ones using civil resistance, um, and so it therefore kind of increases their bargaining space as civil resistors because they compare them against the armed group and think that they're the better option. Um, and then, of course, there's the sense that, um, that violent flanks accelerate the political crisis. They actually are more disruptive and therefore create a sense of urgency around the opponent to negotiate or totally concede uh, to the opposition. Now, uh, there's reasons to think that those mechanisms are compelling. And certainly people have written books and articles about the civil rights movement saying that those were exactly the dynamics of the sort of nonviolent and violent flank of the civil rights movement. Um, I also think that there are reasons to be dubious of these mechanisms, and I'll lay out a couple of reasons why I think that's the case. The first thing that in, is that in a generalized sense, government violence is always worse against violent uh, uh, dissidents, always. Um, and uh, it's bad against nonviolent dissidents. It is, but it's way worse against violent ones. And in fact, what often happens is that when violent flanks develop, the government can't distinguish between who's who, and so they repress everybody. Now, if you believe what I said about the reason why nonviolent resistance is effective is because of mass mobilization and participation, then you know that this is a death knell for nonviolent movements. Because what it means is that people with those mid-level or low-level risk profiles won't participate. What that means is that the nonviolent movement also starts to become very homogenous. Uh, they lose the diversity of participation that they might have, uh, and that then creates this dynamic where it becomes smaller, uh, potentially more radical in a way that alienates potential third-party supporters and pillars of support, and then all of a sudden the movement fails. And typically, you know, the argument is that it failed because of government violence pushing people into violent flanks, but we know that uh, campaigns without violent flanks are more effective, even when they face government violence. So in fact, uh, Kurt Schock and I have a paper under review right now where we use the data that, that Maria and I collected to assess the impact of violent flanks. And we find much more support for the notion that they hurt nonviolent campaigns rather than help them. Um, that's an empirical finding. Um, and they do it through lowering the participation. So uh, movements with violent flanks are smaller uh, than movements without them. And indeed, uh, you could make the argument that, um, that they might be able to compensate for their small size by the limited application of violence, 
Um, but in fact, we find that not to be the case. So, so just um, to put it out there that um, the empirical support now is not in the direction of, of violent flanks, although it is the case sometimes nonviolent movements succeed even though they have a violent flank. South Africa is an example. Uh, to some extent, the civil rights movement um, uh, was a limited example of that. But the reality is that they probably succeeded in spite of the violent flanks rather than because of them. Um, Another kind of myth that's out there is that uh, basically um, there's no real radical change that's possible through nonviolent means. Uh, and I guess it depends on what one's uh, definition is of radical change. Um, but what I can say is that when we look at very difficult outcomes, um, the nonviolent campaigns are much more effective than the violent ones. And my hypothesis is that if we extend that to many other types of outcomes and many other types of domains, that we would find really similar findings. The reason is because I believe in the reasons why nonviolent resistance works, that I think that um, the participation mechanism and the backfire mechanism and the ability to shift methods of dispersion with concentration are basically universal insights that apply to any campaign, um, whether it's against a dictator, whether it's against a racist system, whether it's against a system that per perpetuates climate crises or economic injustice. So um, I want to wrap up by just uh, laying out a couple of remaining research challenges and then talking about uh, how we might help each other change people's minds. So in terms of research challenges, I'll, I'll lay out what I think are kind of the future areas that I hope, like many dissertations, will be written about in the next five years. And if there are any PhD students in here, you really should come talk to me afterward, because I should know who you are, and you should know who I am, and we should also um, like think about what your thesis could be and how it could make a huge contribution. OK, so the first one is, um, is nonviolent resistance among minority groups. So there's been some good research out there about this topic, um, but I think it hasn't necessarily systematically answered the question of how minority groups can include and pull in the numbers they need in order to succeed without destroying the movement in the meantime. So there's this real sense among many minority movements that when they do reach out and start to include people in the majority population that they lose the focus of the movement away from their own particular agenda and into the agenda of the majority. And so somebody needs to write a thesis about this dilemma and, and solutions to it. Not just that it's there, but what, what, what can be done about it. The second thing is um, about this issue of external support and solidarity. Now, some people out there really think that nonviolent campaigns should be supported by anybody who can support them and in any way they can support them. So whether that's financially, whether it's by giving them more attention, um, whether it's by actively participating or engaging in solidarity work, um, and that this could happen by governments, it could happen by NGOs, it could happen by civilian to civilian types of initiatives. And um, I actually think that we have very little empirical support for this notion, and uh, so one of my next studies is actually trying to test that out, um, because my sense is that there are places where that kind of intervention can hurt the campaigns much more than help them. And then there are places where certainly they can't succeed without it. And we want to know better what the situations are there. Um, the third thing that I think is urgent for movements is understanding what kind of leadership structure allows them to amass mass participation, engage in flexible techniques, um, and use all those sort of strategic dynamics in ways that push the movement forward. I think that right now, um, there's a popularized sense that things like leader leaderless resistance, or at least extremely diffused leadership models, are, uh, are superior. Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, and just very basic correlations that I've done in my data, there's a, a generalized uh, correlation that campaigns succeed when they have more of a centralized leadership structure. Now, um, that doesn't mean they have to have a single leader. Actually, the opposite. Um, but having leadership, I think, is very important. Um, and so far, nobody has really uh, gone into uh, systematic research across civil resistance campaigns about this. There has been research on social movements um, in general, but they're mostly in the United States um, and mostly historical movements. And I'd like to know the types of movements we have today around the world, um, what types of leadership structures are optimal. 
And then, of course, there's civil resistance in war zones. Um, and this is a, a very um, topic, that, uh, topic that's very germane to many places around the world. And, and there's been great work done on things like accompaniment and protection of civilians through nonviolent methods in conflict zones. But there's been much less done about how civil resistance campaigns can emerge and succeed in the context of a massive civil breakdown, like a civil war or state collapse. So this is very important, of course, to our friends in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan and Yemen and many other places where there are movements, um, but they have a very tough time eliciting this participation because of the crazy risks there. So I'll just uh, leave us with some ideas maybe about how we might help change minds because one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is how much more angry people get about nonviolent resistance than they do about violence. Um, and, uh, you know, besides the actual data, which was the, one of the biggest surprises I've ever found in research, this is the second biggest surprise. Um, and uh, I've had more shoes thrown at me and things like that about this topic than anything else. So um, how do we change people's minds? Well, I've been thinking a lot about how, how do paradigm shifts take place? And believe it or not, there are eggheads who've actually studied this. And um, one of them found a guy named Thomas Kuhn, um, who wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Don't read it, it's, it's, really, it's really intense, unless you've already read it, in which case, good for you. Um, <clears throat> but but I'll, just, I'll tell you what the, the thesis is, um, so you don't have to. Basically, what he, he, what he was talking about was the huge shift that occurred uh, from the Copernican universe to the Galilean universe, which is the one we still have, for, sort of-ish. And, uh, and basically, this was like one of the biggest paradigm shifts that had happened in the scientific world. And uh, what had happened is that all these scientists had gone with Copernican assumptions all along that everything rotated around the Earth. And so what would happen is they would tweak his theory just a little bit, but they would go with the baseline assumptions, and they would sort of tweak the theory a little bit to try to get the predictions right. They were always just a tiny bit off with their predictions. Sometimes they were way off, and they just could not make sense of it. But there was no other viable alternative to the Copernican universe, because nobody had dared assault his assumptions. So then Galileo comes, and he says, what if uh, everything rotates around the sun, not the Earth? Well, this was like an inviolable assumption. And so, you know, Galileo actually not only dealt with the assumptions, but his new assumptions created basically perfect prediction models. So there was a viable alternative. What did people do? They tried to kill him, <laughs> right? They tried to kill him um, because, you know, like paradigm shifts are scary. It upsets all kinds of power and privilege that's based its existence on um, these basic assumptions. And so, uh, but, you know, it didn't take long um, after they tried to kill him for people to just throw out the Copernican and take on the Galilean and go from there. And so I think that, um, you know, nonviolent resistance is very much like this, where uh, it assaults people's basic assumptions from like what they learned when they were three, you know? Actually what they learned at two is probably much more real than what they learn at three. <laughs> what they learn at two is, what I learned at two anyway, was how to make my parents blindingly angry by just not doing what they wanted me to. And that's, that's nonviolent resistance. By the time I was three, <laughs> by the time I was three, I'd learned how to hit somebody else and, um, you know, and, and kind of like stand in the pecking order and find out if I was the bigger one and whatever. So, um, but I think like, uh, you know, going back, we must unlearn what we have learned, right? In the words of Yoda. And, um, <laughs> and go back to the, those basic roots of, of the terrible twos and, um, and, and uh, remind people of those basic assumptions in a way. Uh, but I also think that there's a lot to be said about just how, how people are taught about this material. And I'm doing some research right now trying to understand whether um, film versus um, text and reading are more effective in teaching people the material about nonviolent resistance. And it's really interesting. I mean, people have very different learning styles. So, so far, the preliminaries on that show me that there's basically no difference, but that some people really learn better from video and other people's learn better from text, of course. 
And so what it means is we really have to diversify the media in which these ideas are permeating our society. Um, and it can't be like unreadable books like the ones I write um, that are, you know, that are really pushing these ideas out there. We need everybody um, expressing in the way that they express best uh, these ideas and, and pushing up against these very damaging and destructive myths that we live with in our society. And if there are any teachers out there who want to uh, make a big stink in their school district, um, one thing that might be done is by um, asking for a reevaluation of elementary school textbooks about the history of the United States. Um, and, <laughs> And I'll just leave you with um, one uh, really quick note on that. Um, uh, this guy named Walter Conser uh, wrote a chapter in a book that Gene Sharp edited back in the early 70s. And then again, he, he wrote another chapter in a book that was edited by Maciej Barkowski in 2013 about um, the fact that the, the history of the United States Revolution is totally wrong because actually uh, the, the decades before the, the shots at Lexington and Concord um, were mass civil disobedience by uh, colonists and, and settlers. Um, the Stamp Act, the, the embargoes of, of uh, exports back to Britain, the, the refusals to engage in the economic system of the colonial power, um, any number of different active campaigns that they engaged in and just their uh, consistent tendency to say no um, were key examples of what then did not have a name. So, of course, it didn't end up in our textbooks. It didn't have a name till Gandhi. Um, but actually, uh, what, what we see is massive decades of civil disobedience prior to the violent part, which was short and abbreviated. And by the time it happened, they were already independent, right? Because they developed their own alternative institutions, economically, socially, and politically, and the Declaration of Independence was the punctuation mark. And so if we thought about the history of, of the United States independence as a history of civil disobedience, and we started teaching our kids that instead of teaching them about the violent part that happened as a reaction to the British reaction, I wonder, like, I wonder whether I would have been more interested in graduate school and studying civil resistance instead of political violence. So. So I think I'm going to leave you with that parting thought. John Deere is going to make a quick announcement, and then I invite questions of all kinds, or even insults. I can take it at this point. Okay. Eric. <laughs> Professor Erica Chenoweth. Wow. So amazing. From now on, I will always think of, there's Galileo and there's Erica Chenoweth. <laughs> we have never had in history a social scientist study and prove that Mohandas Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. and James Lawson, what they taught, was right. 